Hello future TOEFL test takers and welcome to our TOEFL practice video. Today we'll learn the 57 essential words you must know to get a high score on the TOEFL exam and then immediately put them into practice by doing a full reading and listening practice test. This is the perfect exercise if you want to expand your vocabulary and hone your reading and listening skills. Make sure you watch the video until the end and keep track of how many correct answers you get in each section. Write winner in the comments below if you got all the questions right or let me know how many mistakes you made. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to get more tips and tricks about the test, and click the bell icon to be notified when the next video comes out. Without further ado, let's get started. Take a piece of paper and make two columns. In one column, put a plus for the words you know. In the second column, put a minus and write the word itself to mark the words you don't know. Let's get started. One, commodity. This word is super popular on the TOEFL, and I often see it in the reading passages. What's more important, it's often necessary to answer the questions. So, a commodity is any useful or valuable thing, especially something that you can buy or sell, like food, clothes, or electronics. So, coffee, grains, or precious metals are all examples of commodities. I've just seen this word mentioned a few times in two random reading passages, so it's really common for the TOEFL reading. Two, exploit. If you use someone or something, usually selfishly or for profit, you'll exploit them. Factory owners can exploit their employees, making them work overtime. So to exploit is to use something or someone unfairly for your own benefit. On the TOEFL, however, you often see this word used in a slightly different sense. It usually means to make good use of something. For example, to exploit natural resources. The next word on our list is cultivate. The original meaning of this word is to prepare and use land for crops or gardening. So you'll often see it used in texts and lectures about agriculture. People can cultivate fields, gardens, or land. This word can also mean to develop or improve something, such as a skill or relationship. For demise. Demise is the end of something. It can be the end of a person's life or anything else. We often use this word in medical or legal language or when we want to sound formal. On the TOEFL, you'll often see this word used to describe the final stage of something. For example, the demise of a company or the demise of a relationship. Five, prosperity. Another super popular word on the TOEFL test that I see all the time. Prosperity usually means being successful, especially financially. In the US, the decades after World War II were characterized by rising prosperity with large numbers of people moving into the middle class. The adjective prosperous is also very typical for the TOEFL reading and listening sections. It means financially successful. Speaking of the word decade from the example I just gave, this is our next word. A decade is a period of 10 years. We have a decade, 10 years, a century, 100 years, and a millennium, 1000 years. We actually have an entire course dedicated to TOEFL preparation, where we teach you all the words you need to know to score a consistently high on each section of the test. We have lists of words organized by topic, templates for effective speaking and writing responses, strategies for each question type, and more. I'll leave the link to the course below. Another important word to know is alteration. Alteration means a change or modification. The verb to alter means to make something different or to change something, such as altering a plan or altering a law. Remember three words with a similar meaning. To alter, to modify, to change. You'll often need them for the TOEFL reading. 8. Intermittently. I can tell you how many times I see this word. It's a fancy way of saying from time to time, periodically. The adverb intermittently describes something that starts, then stops, and then starts up again. If you studied intermittently last night, it means that sometimes you studied, but sometimes you took breaks to do other things. A phrase with a similar meaning is off and on. 
We came across it just recently in one of our reading videos. This phrase means that something happens periodically, like working off and on or visiting off and on. So remember, off and on or intermittently mean at intervals, not continuously. 10. Extensive. For some reason, this is one of the favorite words of the TOEFL creators. They use it in practically every reading passage or lecture I've ever worked with. And believe me, there have been many. The first and the most popular meaning is covering a large area. For example, extensive road repairs, extensive grounds, or extensive agriculture. So imagine something that covers a large area. That's extensive. Extensive can also mean having a great range. If your knowledge of the TOEFL test is extensive, you know a lot about it. If an event gets extensive coverage in the newspapers, it means many people are writing about it. Next is the word sophisticated. When something is sophisticated, it's complicated and intricate. The inner workings of a computer are sophisticated. It's difficult to understand them unless you're a computer expert. High school math is a lot more sophisticated than grammar school math. Driving a car is more sophisticated than riding a bike. On the TOEFL, you'll often find mentions of sophisticated computer models, sophisticated systems, or sophisticated tools used by Asian people. 12. Diverse. Various, very different. It's another common word that pops up in almost every passage. Diverse means that something has many different parts or elements, such as diverse culture or diverse wildlife. 13. Abruptly, suddenly or without warning. 14. Result in, to cause something to happen. For example, high economic growth results in higher inflation. 15. Mild. Not severe or intense. We often use mild when talking about the weather or climate. Mild weather isn't too cold or too hot. This is the meaning that's most popular on the TOEFL test. However, this word can also be used in other areas. For example, mild criticism. Not severe. A mild heart attack not too serious. The next group of words have similar meanings. They are drastically, dramatically, and spectacularly. I see all three of them all the time, both in the reading and listening. On the TOEFL, they usually mean extremely or a lot. For example, their budget has been drastically reduced. Reduced a lot. The nature of conflict has changed dramatically has changed a lot. This attempt failed spectacularly. Significantly failed. 19. Tolerate. To accept or put up with something. You can tolerate noise or a person. Some people don't tolerate rude behavior. 20. Threat. An impending danger that has the potential to cause serious harm. TOEFL reading passages usually have many examples of threats, such as enemy threats health threats, death threats, and so on. A popular collocation is imminent threat. It's a synonym for impending danger. One more very common word on both the reading and listening sections of the TOEFL is decline. To decline means to decrease or diminish in quantity or quality. We use it when something is getting smaller or worse. For example, the decline of a business or the decline of a population. 22 coerce. To force someone to do something against their will. You can coerce a person to do something, or coerce a decision or a confession from a person. Again, just recently I saw this word in one of the reading passages. We were doing in a one-on-one -on -one session with my student. 23. Retreat. To go away from a place or person. To escape from fighting or danger. The TOEFL likes to use this word in a variety of contexts. You can find information about lizards retreating into the shade or retreating shares of a company. We can even find it in the integrated speaking questions. For example, 
Question three may be about a psychological term in which the speaker understands that their proposals were clearly unreasonable and is forced to retreat. So expect to see this word in many contexts. 24, initially, in the beginning, at first. 25, eventually, in the end, especially after a long time or a lot of effort. A similar word that is often given as a paraphrase for the word eventually is ultimately. It means finally, after a series of things have happened. For example, the company ultimately succeeded or the company ultimately failed. 27. Rival. A few days ago, one of my students made a mistake in the reading passage because she didn't know this word. So I decided to include it in today's list. A rival is a person or thing that competes with another. So it's a synonym for the word competitor. The question she had was the sentence simplification question about terrestrial plans that had the advantages of not having rivals. In the text, there was a line about the land of opportunity, free of competitors. Because she didn't know the word rivals, she couldn't find the right answer. This is a typical example of why you should know synonyms. Otherwise, you'll waste time when answering the questions and you may make mistakes. 28. Data. Information. 29. Conventional. Usual, traditional, ordinary. It's a super popular word that I've also seen used in vocabulary questions. I also see it a lot in the total reading passages. You can find information about conventional explanation of something, conventional farming, conventional medicine, or weapons. 30. Supersede. To replace or surpass something. Some common collocations are supersede a law, supersede a record. Let's look at a typical sentence you might see on the TOEFL test. They still used stone tools similar to those superseded in Europe by metal tools thousands of years ago. Superseded, replaced. As you can see, the most effective way to remember all these new and difficult words is to think of simpler synonyms for them that you already know. That way, the next time you see the word supersede, you'll remember the word replace and will know what it means. Another super popular word I decided to include in this list is fossils. This word means remains or impressions of ancient plants or animals. Fossils look like this. You'll often find lectures and texts about fossils of dinosaurs. Again, I see this word all the time and you just have to know it. 32. Flourish. To grow or develop successfully. Just as your tomatoes can flourish in the summer. Countries, companies, cultural life, the shipbuilding industry, computer technology, and lots of other things and spheres can flourish. People can also flourish, which means that they are successful. Remember we talked about the word prosperity earlier? Well, a synonym for to flourish is to prosper. Another synonym for this word we have on our list is to thrive. Your business or your relationships can thrive. So, remember these three words. To thrive, to prosper, to flourish. All of them mean to be successful. 34. Disruption. An interruption or disturbance. 35. Decay. Another word TOEFL creators love and use all the time. To decay means to rot or become weaker. For example, a building or a relationship can both decay. I recently had a text about how Venice's role as a storage and distribution center for spices, silk, and gold decayed, which means it became weaker and ultimately the city lost its monopoly. If you've taken at least a few TOEFL practice tests, you've probably also come across the idea that carbon decays in living things. Because carbon is radioactive, it decays over time, which means the older artifacts have less carbon than younger ones. This is why so many readings and lectures mention radiocarbon dating, which is a method that uses the decay of carbon to determine the age of organic materials. 36. Rigid. Stiff or fixed. Something that can be moved or bent. 37. Preserve. To keep something from decay, 
or destruction. Simply put, to keep something safe. You can preserve a culture or preserve a historical site. By the way, a site is a place. 38. Depletion. The act of reducing or using something up. Some common collocations with this word are depletion of resources, soil depletion, or depletion of a population. 39. Estimate. To guess or calculate the cost, size, or value of something. As a verb, this word is pronounced estimate. It can also be used as a noun. In this case, we'd say an estimate. An estimate is a judgment or calculation of approximately how large or how great something is. If the mechanic's bill is much higher than the estimate they gave you, for example, you have a right to be angry. 40. Impact. The effect or influence of something on something else. Remember these three words. An impact, an influence, an effect. They are often used as paraphrases on TOEFL. The word impact can also mean the force or action of one object hitting another. For example, the moment two comments collide is called the moment of impact. 41. Inhibit to prevent or stop something from happening. You can inhibit a process or inhibit a reaction. For example, this is the main factor inhibiting online access. Preventing online access. 42. Hibernation. This word is extremely common in academic lectures. Hibernation is a type of deep sleep that some animals, such as bears, for example, go into during the winter. So, simply put, hibernation is like taking a long nap. 43. Divert. The verb to divert means to change the direction or course of something. The police will divert traffic if there has been an accident, which is blocking the road. And it's a good idea to divert some of your income into a savings account, so you don't spend it all. On the TOEFL, you may find mentions of diverted traffic, information, diverted public attention or investigation. 44. Tremendous extremely large. For example, tremendous success or tremendous failure. A similar word is enormous. This word also means very big. An animal can be of an enormous size. Or your parents can have an enormous influence on your life. 46. Emerge. To appear, to come out. Many different things can emerge. For example, details patterns, trends, differences, or theories. A person can emerge from the crowd, or plants often emerge from the ground. 47. Expand. This word comes up all the time on the TOEFL. To expand means to increase in size or scope. You'll find texts about the universe, economy, business, or industries expanding. Markets or cities can also expand. 48. Proliferation. The act of increasing or spreading rapidly. 49. Escalate. To become greater or more serious. The situation started to escalate around noon. The credit crisis is escalating as expected. 50. Surplus. A surplus is something extra or left over. If your tree produces more apples than you can eat, you can make applesauce with the surplus of apples. You will often come across texts about surplus food, surplus money, surplus supplies. 51. Eliminate. This word is a must on the reading and listening sections of the TOEFL. To eliminate means to remove or get rid of something. This is what you do with the four answer options you get. First, you eliminate two options that are definitely wrong. You can also eliminate a problem, a possibility, or a risk. 52. Purchase. To buy something. For example, purchase a house or a car. 53. Obtain. To get something. You can obtain a degree, obtain information, permission, approval, or obtain a job. The next three words on our list have similar meanings. They are obligatory, 
mandatory and compulsory. If something is obligatory, mandatory or compulsory, you must do it because of a rule or a law. For example, this is mandatory to help prevent fraud. Registration was obligatory, but voting was optional. The study skills courses were almost always compulsory. You'll see these words all the time. So be sure to write them down if you don't know them. 57, predominant, more noticeable or important, or greater in number than others. The predominant colors, however, were black and yellow. We'll complete a full TOEFL listening section to test your listening skills and see how well you'd score if you took the test tomorrow. If you want to learn the templates that make up almost half of your answers and allow you to score high on the speaking and writing, click on this link. Now get your pens and pencils ready and let's begin. I've taken this test from the ETS platform. You can find the link to it down below. As we go, you'll listen to the recordings, then go through the questions for each of them. You'll have some time to think about your answers and then the right answer will be revealed. This way, you won't need to wait until the end of the section to analyze your mistakes. I'll also share tips and tricks about the section and point out some important details. A few things to remember before we begin. While the TOEFL listening has never been considered extremely difficult, it's the section where students usually can't get consistent results. It usually happens because of a few reasons. Poor listening skills, inability to stay focused for a long time, limited vocabulary, and poor note-taking. Based on what I see in 101 sessions, and that's the reason I love my 101 sessions so much, as they really help me get a perfect understanding of the typical problems most students have, an inability to focus and poor note-taking are the key issues. In the majority of cases, students understand conversations and lectures pretty well, but the problem is that they either don't write down enough information and then have problems answering some detailed questions, You'll see how important details are later in this video. Or they write down too much and lose track of the recording. It's important to know how to balance and organize your notes in an effective way to succeed. Let's find out what your major issue is. If you already know it, let me know in the comments. The first recording is a conversation between a student and a librarian. For conversations, organize your notes in two columns. So. I'll have a column S for the student's ideas and a column L for the librarian's ideas. As you take notes, use arrows and hyphens to organize information carefully. Don't write down single words. You won't understand them later. It's better to focus on collocations, which are groups of words. So instead of orientation, write down couldn't come orientation. Omit prepositions to write faster. You don't have to be grammatically correct. Let's go. Listen to a conversation between a student and a librarian. Hi, I'm new here. I um, couldn't come to the student orientation, and I'm wondering if you can give me a few quick pointers about the library. I'd really appreciate it. Sure, I'd be glad to. What's your major area of study? Latin American literature. Okay. Well, over here's the section where we have language, literature, and the arts. And if you go downstairs, you'll find the history section. Generally, the students who concentrate in Latin American literature find themselves researching in the history section a lot. Mm -hmm. You're right. I'm a transfer student. I've already done a year at another university, so I know how the research can go. I spent a lot of time in the history section. So how long can I borrow books for? Our loan period is a month. Oh, I should also mention that we have an interlibrary loan service. If you need to get hold of a book that's not in our library, there's a truck that runs between our library and a few other public and university libraries in this area. It comes around three times a week. Hey, that's great. At my last school, it could take a really long time to get the materials I needed. So when I had a project, I had to make a plan way in advance. This sounds much faster. Another thing I was wondering is, is there a place where I can bring my computer and hook it up? 
Sure. There's a whole area here on the main floor where you can bring a laptop and plug it in for power. But on top of that, we also have a connection for the Internet at every seat. Nice. So I can do all the research I need to do right here in the library. I'll have all the resources, all the books and information I need right here in one place. Yep, that's the idea. I'm sure you'll need photocopiers, too. They're down the hallway to your left. We have a system where you have to use a copy card, so you'll need to buy a card from the front desk. You insert it into the machine, and you're ready to make copies. How much do you guys charge? Seven cents a copy. Oh, that's not too bad. Thanks. Um, where's the collection of rare books? Rare books are up on the second floor. They're in a separate room where the temperature is controlled to preserve the old paper in them. You need to get special permission to access them, and then you have to wear gloves to handle them, because... The oils in our hands, you know, can destroy the paper, and gloves prevent that, so we have a basket of gloves in the room. Okay, thanks. I suppose that's all I need to know. You've been very helpful. Thanks. Anytime. Bye. Bye. Time to answer the questions. 1. Why does the student come to the library? To learn about the library's resources. At the beginning of the conversation, he mentioned that he couldn't come to the orientation, so he wanted to learn a few things about the library. 2. Why does the librarian point out the history section to the student? She assumes that he'll need to do research there. She said, the students with art majors usually focus on this section. For the record, a major is the main thing you study in college. Your major can be biology, art, physics, and so on. For conversations, you should know campus vocabulary. Once you study it, understanding the information will become a piece of cake for you. 3. What does the student imply about the interlibrary loan service at his last school? It was inconvenient. 4. What does the student need to do before he can use any rare books? He needs to obtain permission and put on gloves. As you can see, the questions are pretty detailed. So if you don't take notes and only rely on your memory, you might skip some important information and make mistakes. When you practice, make sure you always check if your notes help you figure out the right answer or not. If they don't, listen to the recording once again and adjust them. Question 5. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. I'll have all the resources, all the books and information I need right here in one place. Yep, that's the idea. Which sentence best expresses what the librarian means when she says this? Yep, that's the idea. If she says, yes, that's the idea, it means that is what we intended. These kinds of questions usually test your idiomatic vocabulary. As you practice more, you'll notice that many of these questions use some idiomatic expressions and then want you to figure out what they mean. So the second type of vocabulary to brush up on is idiomatic vocabulary. Congrats! We've finished the first task. Let's move on to the lecture. For lectures, organize information in blocks. Create lists and make spaces between these blocks to help you understand your notes better. It also helps you to get a deeper understanding of the lectures as you go. This lecture is about the theater. Listen to part of a lecture in a class on theater history. The professor is discussing the theater of 19th century France. The 19th century was the time that saw what we call realism develop in the European theater. Uh, to understand this though, we first need to look at an earlier form of drama known as the well-made play, which basically was a pattern for constructing plays. Plays that, uh, beginning with some early 19th century comedies in France, proved very successful commercially. The dramatic devices used here weren't actually anything new. They'd been around for centuries. But the, the formula for a well-made play required that certain of these elements be included in a particular order, and most importantly, that everything in the play be logically connected. In fact, some of these playwrights would start by writing the end of a play and work backward toward the beginning, 
just to make sure each event led logically from what had gone before. Okay, so what are the necessary elements of a well-made play? Well, uh, the first is logical exposition. Exposition is whatever background information you have to reveal to the audience so they'll understand what's going on. Before this time, exposition might have come from actors simply giving speeches. Uh, someone might walk out on a stage and say, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, and then tell all about the feuding families of Romeo and Juliet. But for the well-made play, even the exposition had to be logical, uh, believable. So, for example, uh, you might have two servants gossiping as they're cleaning the house, and one says, oh, what a shame the master's son is still not married. And the other might mention a rumor about a mysterious gentleman who's just moved into town with his beautiful daughter. These comments are part of the play's logical exposition. The next key element of a well-made play is referred to as the inciting incident. After we have the background information, we need a key moment that gets things moving, that really makes the audience interested in what happens to the characters we just heard about. So, for example, after the two servants reveal all this background information, we meet the young man. Just as he first lays eyes on the beautiful young woman, and immediately falls in love. This is the inciting incident. It sets off the plot of the play. Now, the plot of a well-made play is usually driven by secrets, uh, things that the audience knows, but the characters often don't know. So, for example, the audience learns through a letter or through someone else's conversation who this mysterious gentleman is and why he left the town many years before. But the young man doesn't know about this, and the woman doesn't understand the ancient connection between her family and his. And before the secrets are revealed to the main characters, the plot of the play proceeds as a series of sort of up and down moments. For example, the woman first appears not to even notice the young man, and it seems to him like the end of the world. But then he learns that she actually wants to meet him, too. So life is wonderful. Then if he tries to talk with her, maybe her father gets furious for no apparent reason. So they can't see each other. But just as the young man has almost lost all hope, he finds out... Well, you get the idea. The reversals of fortune continue, increasing the audience's tension and excitement making them wonder if everything's going to come out okay or not. Next comes an element known as the obligatory scene. It's a, it's a scene, a moment, in which all the secrets are revealed. And generally, things turn out well for the hero and others we care about. A happy ending of some sort. This became so popular that a playwright almost had to include it in every play, which is why it's called the obligatory scene. And that's followed by the final dramatic element, the denouement, or the resolution, when all the loose ends have to be tied up in a logical way. Remember, uh, the obligatory scene gives the audience emotional pleasure, but the denouement offers the audience a logical conclusion. That's the subtle distinction we need to try very hard to keep in mind. So, as I said, the well-made play, this form of playwriting, became the basis for realism in drama and for a lot of very popular 19th century plays. And also, a pattern we find in the plots of many later plays and even movies that we see today. Time to answer the questions. Number one. What is the lecture mainly about? This is the question you'll get asked after every lecture. The right answer is usually something that was discussed the most. In this case, successful standard formula for writing plays. Note that it's not a famous example of a well-made play. 
they're talking about plays in general. 2. According to the professor, why did some playwrights write the end of a play before the beginning? To ensure that the plot would develop in a logical manner. If you didn't catch this in the recording, feel free to use logic. Why would you write the end of a play before the beginning? Probably so that you already know how things will turn out at the end and can organize the events in the play logically. Also, feel free to always start by eliminating the two options that are definitely incorrect. Then you can choose between the remaining two. Three. Why does the professor mention a conversation between two servants? To show how background information might be revealed in a well-made play. 4. According to the professor, what dramatic elements are typically included in a well-made play to help move the plot forward? A series of major changes in the hero's apparent chances of success? and information known to the audience, but not to the main characters. Again, always check your notes for such details. The professor said that the plot is usually driven by secrets and there is a series of ups and downs. In the lecture, he made an example of when the woman in the play doesn't notice the man at first and then he learns that she wants to meet him and then he tries to talk to her, but her father gets furious all of a sudden. These are ups and downs in the play. 5. What does the professor imply about the obligatory scene and the denouement? The difference between them might be unclear to some people. 6. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. This is the inciting incident. It sets off the plot of the play. Why does the professor say this? It sets off the plot of the play. This is the inciting incident. It sets off the plot of the play. Of course, that's the definition of the term. So the right answer is to help students understand the meaning of a new term. Good. One more task done. Time for another conversation. Listen to a conversation between a student and a business professor. So, Richard, what's up? Well, I know we have a test coming up on chapters... Um... Chapters three and four from your textbook. Right, three and four. Well, I, um... I didn't get something you said in class Monday. All right. Do you remember what it was about? Yeah, you were talking about a gym, a health club where people can go to exercise, that kind of thing. Okay, but the health club model is actually from Chapter 5, so... Oh, Chapter 5. Oh, so it's not... Okay, but I guess I still want to try to understand... Oh, of course. Well, I was talking about an issue in strategic marketing. Um, the health club model. Um, I mean, with a health club, you might think they would have trouble attracting customers, right? Well, I know when I pass by a health club and I see all those people working out, the exercising, I just as soon walk on by. Yeah, there's that. Plus, lots of people have exercise equipment at home, or they can play sports with their friends, right? Sure. But nowadays, in spite of all that, and expensive membership fees, health clubs are hugely popular. So, how come? I guess that's what I didn't understand. Okay. Basically, they have to offer things that most people can't find anywhere else. You know, quality. That means better exercise equipment, high-end stuff, um, and classes, exercise classes, maybe aerobics. I'm not sure if I... Okay, I get it. Yeah. And you know, another thing is, I think people probably feel good about themselves when they're at the gym. And they can meet new people, socialize. Right. So health clubs offer high-quality facilities, and also they sell an image about people having more fun, relating better to others, and improving their own lives if they become members. Sure, that makes sense. Well then, uh, can you think of another business or organization that could benefit from doing this? Um... Think about an important building on campus here. Something everyone uses. A major source of information. You mean like an administrative building? Well, that's not what I had in mind. Oh, you mean the library? 
Exactly. Libraries. Imagine public libraries. They're an information resource for the whole community, right? Well, they can be. But now with the internet and big bookstores, you can probably get what you need without going to a library. Well, that's true. So, if you were the director of a public library, what would you do about that? To get more people to stop in? Well, like you said, better equipment, maybe a super fast internet connection, and not just a good variety of books, but also like nice, comfortable areas where people can read and do research. Things that make them want to come to the library and stay. Great. Oh, and maybe have authors come and do some readings or, I don't know, special presentations, something people couldn't get at home. Now you're getting it. Thanks, Professor Wilkins. I think so too. What is the conversation mainly about? A strategy for attracting customers. While the student first came to clarify some points for the upcoming test, the whole conversation was about ways to attract customers for different businesses. Two. What does the professor imply about the upcoming test? It will not contain questions about the health club model. Because this information is from chapter 5, which is not part of the test. 3. Based on the conversation, indicate whether each of the following is offered by health clubs. You see, this is what I was talking about when I said that the questions in this section are very detailed. And this is where a list of your notes would have come in handy. Low membership fees? No. They have high fees instead. High quality facilities? Yes. Exercise classes? Yes. Positive self-image? Yes. Special presentations? No. Presentations were mentioned when they talked about libraries. Four. What does the professor imply about public libraries? they need to give greater emphasis to strategic marketing. This is because they are not very popular today and have to work even harder to attract customers. Five. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. I mean, with a health club, you might think they would have trouble attracting customers, right? Well, I know when I pass by a health club and I see all those people working out, exercising, I just as soon walk on by. Why does the student say this? Well, I know when I pass by a health club and I see all those people working out, exercising, I just as soon walk on by. To give an example that supports the professor's point. Next lecture. This one is about geology, so stay focused. It might contain some more challenging vocabulary. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. Last time we started to talk about glaciers and how these masses of ice form from crystallized snow. And some of you were amazed at how huge some of these glaciers are. Now, even though it may be difficult to understand how a huge mass of ice can move or flow is another word for it, it's really no secret that glaciers flow because of gravity. But how they flow, the way they flow needs some explaining. Now, the first type of glacier flow is called basal slip. Basal slip, or sliding as it's often called, basically refers to the slipping or sliding of a glacier across bedrock, actually across a thin layer of water on top of the bedrock. Um, so this process shouldn't be too hard to imagine. What happens is that the ice at the base of a glacier is under a great deal of pressure the pressure coming from the weight of the overlying ice. And you probably know that under pressure, the melting temperature of water, uh, of the ice, I mean, is reduced. So ice at the base of the glacier melts, even though it's below zero degrees Celsius. And this results in a thin layer of water between the glacier and the ground. This layer of water reduces friction. It's, it's like a, a lubricant and it allows the glacier to slide or slip over the bedrock, okay? Now the next type of movement we'll talk about is called deformation. You already know that ice is brittle. If you hit it with a hammer, it'll shatter like glass. But ice is uh, also plastic. It can change shape without breaking. If you leave 
for example, a bar of ice supported uh, only at one end, the end, the unsupported end, will deform under its own weight. It'll kind of flatten out at one end, get distorted, deformed. Think of deformation as a very slow oozing. Depending on the stresses on the glacier, I, the ice crystals within it reorganize. And during this reorganization, the ice crystals realign in a way that allows them to slide past each other. And so the glacier oozes downhill without any ice actually melting. Now, there are a couple of factors that affect the amount of deformation that takes place or the speed of the uh, glacier's movement. For example, deformation is more likely to occur the thicker the ice is because of the gravity of the weight of the ice. And temperature also plays a part here in that cold ice does not move as easily as ice that is closer to the melting point. In fact, it's not too different from uh, the way oil is, uh, thicker at lower temperatures. So if you have a glacier in a slightly warmer region, it will flow faster than a glacier in a cooler region. Okay, um, now I'd like to touch briefly on extension and compression. Your textbook includes these as types, as a particular type of glacier movement, but you'll see that there are as many textbooks that omit it as a type of movement as include it. And I might not include it right now if it weren't in your textbook. But uh, basically, the upper parts of glaciers have less pressure on them, so they don't deform as easily. They tend to be more brittle. And crevasses can form in these upper layers of the glacier when the glacier comes into contact with bedrock walls or uh, is otherwise under some kind of stress but can't deform quickly enough. So the ice will expand or constrict, and that can cause big fissures, big cracks to form in the surface layers of the ice. And that brittle surface ice moving is sometimes considered a type of glacial movement, depending on which source you're consulting. Now, as you probably know, glaciers generally move really slowly, but sometimes they experience surges. And during these surges, in some places, they can move at speeds as high as 7,000 meters per year. Now, speeds like that are pretty unusual, hundreds of times faster than the regular movement of glaciers, but you can actually see glaciers move during these surges, though it is rare. Time to look at the questions. One, what is the lecture mainly about? explanations of how glaciers move. 2. The professor discusses the process of basal slip. Put the steps in the correct order. Again, a test of your note-taking skills. For processes, I usually write down lines with information connected by arrows. This helps write down things faster. Here, Pressure is increased on the ice is number one. A liquid layer forms at the base of the glacier is two. Then friction between the glacier and bedrock is reduced and the glacier begins to slide. Again, if you got it wrong, you need to adjust your notes. Three, what factors are involved in the amount of deformation a glacier undergoes? Thickness of glacial ice, the temperature of the glacial ice. 4. What does the professor say about the speed of glaciers? It can be fast enough for movement to be noticeable. 5. What does the professor explain when he says this? But ice is uh, also plastic. It can change shape without breaking. If you leave, for example, a bar of ice supported uh, only at one end, the end, the unsupported end, will deform under its own weight. A characteristic of ice that is related to glacial movement. Six, what does the professor imply about compression and extension? He is not convinced that it's a type of glacial movement. Finally, the last lecture is in the art class. There is an interesting observation I've made. Very often, 
Lectures on humanities subjects have easier vocabulary, but contain a lot of details and have more complex questions. Lectures on sciences feature more challenging lexes instead, but have simpler questions. Have you noticed something like that when you practice? Let me know. Listen to part of a lecture in an art history class. We've been talking about the art world of the late 19th century in Paris, and today I'd like to look at the women who went to Paris at that time to become artists. Now, um, from your reading, what do you know about Paris, about the art world of Paris during the late 19th century? People came from all over the world to study. It had a lot of art schools and artists who taught painting. There were, our book mentions classes for women artists. And uh, it was a good place to go to study art. If you wanted to become an artist, Paris was not a good place to go. Paris was the place to go. And women could find skilled instructors there. Now, before the late 19th century, if they, uh, women who wanted to become artists, had to take private lessons or learn from family members, they had more limited options than men did. But around 1870, some artists in Paris began to offer classes for female students. These classes were for women only. And by the end of the 19th century, it became much more common for women and men to study together in the same classes. So, uh, so within a few decades, things had changed significantly. Uh, okay, let's back up again and talk about the time period from the 1860s to the 1880s and talk more about what happened in women's art classes. In 1868, a private art academy opened in Paris, and for decades it was probably the most famous private art school in the world. Its founder, Rodolphe Julien, was a canny businessman and quickly established his school as a premier destination for women artists. What he did was, after an initial trial period of mixed classes, he changed the school policy. He completely separated the men and women students. Any reason why he did that? Well, like I said, Julian was a brilliant businessman with progressive ideas. He saw that another small private art school where all the students were women was very popular at that time. And that's probably why he adopted the women only classes. These classes were typically offered by, uh, by established artists and were held in the studio, uh, the place where they painted. This was a big deal because finally women could study art in a formal setting. And there was another benefit to the group setting of these classes. The classes included weekly criticism, and the teacher would rank the art of all the students in the class from best to worst. How would you like it if I did that in this class? <laughs> no way. But our textbook said that the competitive, the competition was good for women. It helped them see where they needed to improve. Isn't that interesting? Uh, one woman artist, uh, her name was uh, Marie Bashkirtsev. Uh, Bashkirtsev once wrote how she felt about a classmate's work. She thought her classmate's art was much better than her own, and it gave her an incentive to do better. Overall, the competition in the women's art classes gave women more confidence. Confidence that they could also compete in the art world after their schooling. And even though Bashkirtsev couldn't study in the same classes as men, she was having an impact as an artist. Um, just look at the Salon. What do you know about the Salon? It was a big exhibition, uh, a big art show that they had in Paris every year. The art had to be accepted by judges. It was a big deal. You could make a name for yourself. You could have a painting or sculpture in the Salon and go back to your home country saying you'd been a success in Paris. Uh, it was sort of a, a seal of approval. It was a great encouragement for an artist's career. And by the last two decades of the 19th century, one-fifth of the paintings in the Salon were by women, much higher than in the past. In fact, Marie Bashkirtsev herself had a painting in the Salon in 1881. Interestingly, this masterpiece called In the Studio 
is a painting of the interior of Julian's art school. Uh, it's not in your textbook. Uh, I'll show you the painting next week. Uh, the painting depicts an active, crowded studio with women drawing and painting a live model. It was actually, Bashkirtsev actually followed Julian's savvy suggestion and painted her fellow students in a class at the school with the artist herself at the far right. A great advertisement for the school when the painting eventually hung at the salon, for a women's studio had never been painted before. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? How opportunities for women artists in Paris improved. This one is easy. They talked about opportunities for women artists a lot. 2. What point does the professor make about Julian when he mentions that Julian's art school offers some classes only for women? Julian possessed outstanding business skills. The lecturer called him a canny and brilliant businessman. So, he has outstanding business skills. 3. What does the professor emphasize as one benefit of competition in women's classes? Women gained more confidence in their artistic abilities. 4. According to the professor, what were two ways that the situation of women artists had changed by the end of the 19th century in Paris? Women and men took art classes together. Women artists played a greater role in the salon exhibitions. 5. What does the professor imply about Bashkirtsev's painting in the studio? It was beneficial for both Bashkirtsev and the school where she studied. The professor mentioned that it was the first time when such a thing was done, which obviously made the school more popular. 6. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. It had a lot of art schools and artists who taught painting? There were... Our book mentions classes for women artists. And uh, it was a good place to go to study art. If you wanted to become an artist, Paris was not a good place to go. Paris was the place to go. What does the professor mean when he says this? If you wanted to become an artist, Paris was not a good place to go. Paris was the place to go. If the professor says Paris was the place to go, he means that Paris was the most important place for an artist to study and work. Today, we are going to analyze a passage from the TOEFL reading section so that you can see for yourself that this section is not as scary as it may seem. We'll analyze the question types, review the strategies for them, and most importantly, learn how to apply these strategies to real tests. If you're watching this video now and want to know the templates that make up half of your answers and allow you to score high on the TOEFL speaking and writing sections, click on the link down below. You can choose the pro package if you want to have your essays and speaking responses scored. I personally find this option the most helpful because I'll tell you exactly what you are doing wrong and what you should do differently to get a higher score. I often see students with a good level of English who could have scored high, but they just do the wrong things and keep scoring low. And very often, there are just a few little things that stand between them and getting the score they really deserve. For example, in many consultations, we practice the first question of the speaking section, and I show how to break it down into several steps. That way, when you have 45 seconds to speak, you no longer panic, but know exactly what to say. I'm even starting to think about sharing some of these tips on this channel, because I feel like it would have made many students' lives a lot easier. Let me know if you'd find that interesting. The passage we'll cover today is about the rise of Teotihuacan, an ancient city near Mexico City. On the day of the test, you'll have two passages like this, with 10 questions after each. Don't read the text. Go straight to the first question. If you're a fast reader, you might go through the passage first, 
but in my experience, it's not necessary. This is a negative factual information question because we see the word except. This means that we need to find what information is not given in the text. For this type of question, look at the answer options and then read the paragraph. As always, pause the video and answer the question yourself first. Then continue watching to see if you're right. The correct answer is two, several administrative centers spread across the city. The text mentions an administrative center, but not several centers spread across the city. An indefinite article equals one. The other options are all listed as features of the city. Remember, information in the text will usually be paraphrased. For example, regularly arranged streets, a regular grid pattern of streets and buildings, many manufacturing workshops, a large number of industrial workshops, apartment complexes, over 2,000 apartment complexes. To recap, for this question type, it's much easier to look through the options, identify the keywords, and then read the paragraph, already having in mind what you're looking for. Question two. Vocabulary question. I always say that there are two types of vocabulary questions. The ones where you know the word in question, and in this case, finding the right answer is usually a piece of cake. And the ones where you don't know the word. Such questions are more challenging. A typical mistake many students make is only trying to guess the meaning of the unfamiliar word from context. Very often, context won't give you much information about the word's meaning. So, apart from doing that, you might also try to analyze the word itself. Look at its prefix, suffix, and root. Now, take your time to answer this question. Ingenuity is a noun. An adjective is ingenious. A genius is a person who is very clever, which means that ingenious is someone who shows creativity and talent and is very smart. So, ingenuity is cleverness. Don't confuse the adjective ingenious with a similar adjective, ingenuous. An ingenuous person is innocent and unsuspecting. Three, another negative factual information question we need to find a statement that's not mentioned in the text. So start by analyzing the statements first and then read the paragraph. The right answer is three, a long period of volcanic inactivity in the Teotihuacan Valley. Remember that you're looking for the option that is not stated in the text. Many students often get so excited to find the first statement in the text that they mark it as the right option and move on. That's why they capitalize words like not and except in the text. To eliminate one option, you need to find all other three statements in the text. Let's find them. The presence of obsidian in the Teotihuacan Valley. The obsidian resources in the valley itself. For the record, Obsidian is a dark natural glass that looks like this. The potential for extensive irrigation of Teotihuacan Valley lands. The valley's potential for extensive irrigation. Irrigation is when we water land or crops. Teotihuacan's location on a natural trade route. Geographic location on a natural trade route to the south and east of the Valley of Mexico. 4. An inference question. In this type of question, you need to draw a conclusion based on the text. For this particular question, I need to find what can be inferred from paragraph 3 about Cuicuilco prior to 200 BC. Prior means before. As I go through the paragraph, I try to break it into a few simple main ideas. The paragraph mentions that prior to 200 BC, 
Quilco was the largest of several relatively small centers in and near the Valley of Mexico. Around 200 BC, a volcanic eruption seriously affected Quiquilco, covering much of its agricultural land with lava. The eruption eliminated Quiquilco as a potential rival, enabling other towns, including Teotihuacan, to emerge as leading economic and political centers. So the fact that Quiquilco's agricultural land was destroyed eliminated it as a potential rival. This means that before 200 BC, its economy relied heavily on agriculture. So D is correct. Watch out for keywords, especially those connected to time. They usually provide you with the key information to answer the question. Five, another vocabulary question. Predominant is the strongest or main. So principle is the right answer. Again, if you don't know this word, think about the adjective dominant or the noun dominance. Both of them signify power and influence. This will make it easier for you to choose the correct synonym. If you struggle with academic vocabulary, you can watch this video and test how ready you are to take the TOEFL test. There, I use a lot of TOEFL vocabulary questions, so it's a great way to drill this type of question as well. Moving on. Question six. Which of the following allow Teotihuacan to have a competitive edge over its neighbors? Let's read the full sentence and try to formulate the answer ourselves first. It seems likely that Teotihuacan's natural resources along with the city elite's ability to recognize their potential, gave the city a competitive edge over its neighbors. So, there are two things that gave the city a competitive edge over its neighbors. Its natural resources and the ability of the elite to recognize their potential. As I look through the answer options, I see that A is correct. This is a test on whether or not you know the word commodity. A commodity is any useful or valuable thing, especially something that is bought and sold. Grain, coffee, and precious metals are all commodities. So in this case, natural resources is a paraphrase of the word commodity. They were available or readily available, and the elite could recognize their potential. They were well exploited. Question seven. This is a factual information question. In this type of question, you need to find detailed information based on the paragraph. For this question type, you should carefully read the question, identify keywords, and then locate the right part of the paragraph and read it. It will usually be one to three sentences. Pause the video now and give it a try. The keywords are research, obsidian tools, and Almec sites. As I scan the paragraph, I see that recent research on obsidian tools found in Almec sites has shown that some of the obsidian obtained by the Almecs originated near Teotihuacan. This means that they got obsidian from the place near Teotihuacan, which means the D is correct. Just for the record, if you keep reading, you'll see the word commodity used once again. So it's a useful word to know. Eight, in paragraph six, the author discusses the thriving obsidian operation in order to. For this question, we need to find why the author discusses the thriving obsidian operation. So let's find it in the text. It's right in the second sentence. For this type of question, I usually suggest reading the sentence before and after the one that contains the information given. So, let's read the first three sentences and find the right answer. Ready to check? I can see that the information in the question is given as an example. This means that it illustrates something given in the previous sentence. The picture of Teotihuacan that emerges is a classic picture of positive feedback among several factors. I can also see that 
all this led to increased wealth. So option C is correct. Moving on. Time for my favorite question. Insert text question. It's one of the most challenging questions for students, so in our course, we usually dedicate a lot of time to help you master it and complete it in a fast and effective way. The major problem with this question is that most students try to really understand the whole paragraph and waste a lot of time on that. So, even if they end up with the right answer, which they usually don't, they still spend too much time on the question and often have to rush later on. In this question type, you need to find where the sentence could be added to the passage. Take your time to answer this question. The right answer is D. In the last sentence of the paragraph, we learn that the city had economic and perhaps religious contacts with most parts of Mesoamerica. And then we add our sentence, which illustrates this fact. It provides examples of how far its context went. Finally, the summary question. You should complete the summary by selecting the three answer choices that express the most important ideas in the passage. For this question type, you should 1. Choose the major ideas. 2. Avoid options that are too general, which makes them irrelevant and also options that are too specific, which makes them minor details. 3. Choose the options that contain several ideas mentioned in the text, ideally those that contain the main ideas of a few paragraphs. And 4. Avoid choosing two options that cover the same information. The right answers are A, D, and E. All these options contain many ideas that we already remember from doing the previous questions. If you don't remember any of them, you can always come back to the text and quickly scan each paragraph, looking for the main idea. It's not very difficult, as you already know many paragraphs well from doing questions 1 to 9. A small tip from me. As you go through the previous questions, pause for a second as you move from one paragraph to another and think about the main idea of the paragraph you just covered. You can even write these main ideas down, very quickly obviously, as you go through the text. This will save you a lot of your time later, when you do the summary question, as you won't need to go back to the text at this stage. Today we are going to analyze a passage from the TOEFL reading section together. And at the end of the video, I'll give you the ultimate prep strategy to consistently score high on the TOEFL reading section, so be sure to watch until the end. Let's get started! Question 1. According to paragraph 1, which of the following is true of the late Cretaceous climate? The factual information question. The keyword is the late Cretaceous climate. So, I need to find the part of the paragraph that talks about it. Let's read it. Data from diverse sources, including geochemical evidence preserved in seafloor sediments, indicate that the late Cretaceous climate was milder than today's. The days were not too hot, nor the nights too cold. The summers were not too warm, nor the winters too frigid. The shallow seas on the continents probably buffered the temperature of the nearby air, keeping it relatively constant. The main conclusion is that the climate at that time was milder than it is today. Now, looking at the choices, I can immediately see that D is the correct answer. Mild weather is pleasant, because it's neither extremely hot nor extremely cold so it doesn't change much from season to season. I can always double-check that all the other options are not correct. A is incorrect because the summers were not too warm, nor the winters too frigid. B is incorrect because the shallow seas on the continents kept the temperature relatively constant. Now, C is wrong because the climate was milder than today's, so, it wasn't very similar. A few words to remember. Mild climate. Not too cold, not too hot. Off and on. Or on and off. At intervals. Once in a while. 
flourish, thrive, extensive, covering a large area, diverse, very different, shallow, not deep, dramatically, in this context, in a noticeable way, a lot. Play tectonics. This, by the way, is what we teach you in our TOEFL course. We go through the question types, discuss the strategies, and then analyze complete reading sections together, similar to what we're doing now, but in more depth, so that you learn how to apply these strategies on the real TOEFL test. This will help you feel confident on test day. You will also learn the templates for high-scoring answers on the speaking and writing sections, important vocabulary for the listening section, and tips and tricks to improve your timing during the test. The link to the course is below. If you need help with your TOEFL preparation, click on it and join our TOEFL community. Question 2. Why does the author mention the survival of snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodiles in paragraph 3? This is the rhetorical purpose question. For this question, it's good to know these words. To argue, to illustrate, to question, to explain, to present, to refute, to know, to support. The first thing to do here is to read the entire sentence. If true, though, why did cold-blooded animals, such as snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodiles, survive the freezing winters and torrid summers? It's a question. So, without even looking anywhere else in the text, my bet would be that the right answer is B, to question something. That's why I say it's important to know the words I just mentioned. But let's double check. The question starts with if true, which means it refers back to something already mentioned in the text. This means you need the previous paragraph. After reading it, I see that first, the seaways retreated from the continents. Then, they pulled back, which made climates around the world more extreme, less mild as we now know. And maybe dinosaurs could not tolerate these extreme temperature changes and became extinct. So, the question we have does indeed question the adequacy of the hypothesis that climatic change related to sea levels caused the extinction of the dinosaurs, which means that B is correct. Question 3. Another factual information question. According to paragraph 3, which of the following is true of changes in climate before the Cretaceous period and the effects of these changes on dinosaurs? This question addresses the same paragraph, which is quite common on the TOEFL test. We also already know that the paragraph begins by questioning the theory about climate change related to sea levels causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. So, let's keep reading to find out more. The text says that it's hard to understand why snakes, lizards, turtles, and crocodiles would not be affected while dinosaurs were affected. We also learned that shallow seaways had retreated from and advanced on the continents many times during the Mesozoic era. So it's odd that dinosaurs had survived the earlier climate changes, but not this one. Finally, we get to the most important sentence. Although initially appealing, the hypothesis of a simple climatic change related to sea levels is insufficient to explain all the data. This means that climate changes associated with the movement of seaways before the Cretaceous period did not cause dinosaurs to become extinct, which is why A is the correct option. A short break for some vocabulary. Numerous, many, not few, torrid, very hot and dry. The text mentions torrid summers, at the mercy of, in the power of, maintain, keep, retreat, move back, withdraw. Let's move on. Question 4. The vocabulary question. Fluctuations 
are variations. Think of them as waves that go up and down, up and down. Fluctuations, variations. Question five. Which of the sentences below best expresses the essential information in the highlighted sentence in paragraph four? The famous sentence simplification question. Read the sentence, break it down into two or three main ideas. Pay close attention to any linking words or conjunctions and then formulate your summary before looking at the answer options. Let's give it a try. Many plants and animals disappear abruptly from the fossil record as one moves from layers of rock documenting the end of the Cretaceous up into rocks representing the beginning of the Cenozoic era after the Mesozoic. So many plants and animals suddenly disappear, abruptly equals suddenly disappear from where? From the fossil record. The fossil record is this. It's made up of all the fossils that have been found along with their relative ages. As we go from rocks that document the end of the Cretaceous period into the rocks that document the beginning of the Cenozoic era, the era after the Mesozoic. If we don't have animals and plants in the fossil record, it means that we didn't find the fossils, which are remnants of animals or plants, which means that they went extinct. So A is the right answer. A few tips here. As you read the sentence, focus on the main ideas, not on the words you don't know. Also, if the question is difficult, start by eliminating two incorrect options straight away and then choose between the remaining two. Question six. In paragraph four, all of the following questions are answered except the negative factual information question. For this question, we need to find what's not given in the text. So start by analyzing the answer options first, then read the paragraph. A is correct. All the other questions are answered in the text. B is answered in this part of the text. Scientists felt that they could get an idea of how long the extinctions took by determining how long it took to deposit this one centimeter of clay. C is answered in this part. Dissatisfaction with conventional explanations for dinosaur extinctions led to a surprising observation that, in turn, has suggested a new hypothesis. D. Why did scientists want more information about the dinosaur extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous is also answered. It's because they were dissatisfied with conventional explanations for dinosaur extinctions. Conventional, standard, a very popular word on the TOEFL test. By the way, if vocabulary is your weakness, you can watch these three videos that I dedicated exclusively to the words you should know to ace the TOEFL reading and listening sections. Question seven is the inference question. Paragraph five implies that a special explanation of the iridium in the boundary clay is needed because. For this question type, it's better to read the paragraph, break it into a few main ideas, and then look at the answer options. As I'm reading, I find the part that says, iridium is found in high concentrations in some meteorites. Even today, microscopic meteorites continually bombard Earth, falling on both land and sea. By measuring how many of these meteorites fall to Earth over a given period of time, scientists can estimate how long it might have taken to deposit the observed amount of iridium in the boundary clay. These calculations suggest that a period of about 1 million years would have been required. However, other reliable evidence suggests that the deposition of the boundary clay could not have taken 1 million years. So the unusually high concentration of iridium seems to require a special explanation. From reading this, I can assume that the amount of iridium in the boundary clay 
is too great to have come from microscopic meteorites during the time the boundary clay was deposited. Which makes D the right answer. Question 8. One more vocabulary question. Disruption of the food chain. To disrupt means to interrupt an event, an activity, or process by causing a disturbance or problem. So B, disturbance, is correct. Question 9. The insert text question. For this question, there are a few strategies you can use to find the right answer faster. If you don't know them, you'll end up wasting too much time. One of these strategies is the use of pronouns, which often helps to eliminate the incorrect options. For example, look at these two sentences. Even today, microscopic meteorites continually bombard Earth, falling in both land and sea. By measuring how many of these meteorites, these shows that the meteorites were already mentioned, which means that if I had to insert this sentence, I would be looking for a sentence like even today, which has the word meteorites in it. Similarly, I can eliminate A. It starts with these calculations, which refers to the estimates, how long it might have taken to deposit the observed amount of iridium in the boundary clay mentioned in the previous sentence. So I can't break this link and insert my sentence here. B is also incorrect. The sentence these calculations suggest that a period of about 1 million years would have been required. Mentions 1 million years. The following sentence contradicts it and says, however, other reliable evidence suggests that the deposition of the boundary clay could not have taken 1 million years. So again, these two sentences are well connected and I don't want to disrupt our new word, this connection. C seems like a good option. Because of other reliable evidence, we learned that the deposition of the boundary clay could not have taken 1 million years, which is why, or consequently, the idea that the iridium in the boundary clay came from microscopic meteorites cannot be accepted. It fits logically in this place also because the next sentence concludes that because this idea cannot be accepted, the unusually high concentration of iridium seems to require a special explanation. So C is correct. For those wondering, boundary clay looks like this. Finally, the last and most difficult question type is the prose summary question. You should select three statements that best describe the main ideas in the reading passage. Let's read the introductory statement. For a long time, scientists have argued that the extinction of the dinosaurs was related to climate change. So we want to choose sentences that would shed more light on the situation. These are the correct answers. They are the main ideas of the paragraphs of the passage. You should remember them from answering the previous questions. They are not too specific nor too general and they cover as many main ideas from the passage as possible. The first option addresses the first three paragraphs that talk about how a climate change hypothesis is insufficient. The second option addresses the fourth and the fifth paragraphs, talking about abrupt extinctions and the high concentration of iridium. Finally, the third one focuses on the last paragraph's main idea. Now, extreme changes in daily and seasonal climates preceded the retreat of the seas back into the major ocean basins is a too specific option which makes it irrelevant. The retreat of the seaways at the end of the Cretaceous has not been fully explained? Again, irrelevant. We want to choose sentences that would make sense even to a person who didn't read this text. Imagine you want to summarize this text to your friend in just three sentences. They have to make sense, otherwise they won't understand it. This brings us to the ultimate strategy you can use to ace the reading section of the TOEFL test. First, take two to three real practice tests 
under test conditions to get your score and estimate your level. This will also help you familiarize yourself with the structure of the test. Then analyze your scores and look for patterns. Find out how many questions you got wrong, which types of questions were most challenging for you, and which were easy. Also, think about what prevented you from doing better. Maybe your vocabulary is too limited and you don't know many words, or maybe you have problems with strategy. Some students may also have timing problems. This is when you score well without timing yourself, but can perform as well under time pressure. Once you have completed the analysis, work on your weaknesses, practice different types of questions, first slowly without timing yourself to perfect your strategy, and then with timing. When you feel confident with all types of questions, start doing complete reading sections again and keep track of your scores. Avoid making assumptions when answering questions. Always look for evidence in the passage to support your answer. When I work with my students one-on-one -on, -one on the reading section, I always ask them why when they say they think the answer is correct. It really helps you to always look for evidence instead of just making a random guess. And it ensures high scores. Now it's time to calculate your results. Write winner in the comments below if you answered all the questions correctly. If you made any mistakes, let me know which question types were the most difficult and how many correct answers you got overall. We've come to the end of our lesson. Thanks for watching. For those of you who are struggling with TOEFL reading or listening, we have a TOEFL course where you can schedule a consultation with me. I'll analyze your performance and tell you what you need to do differently to get a better score. The link is below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and tricks on how to ace the TOEFL test. As always, I wish you all a stellar TOEFL score. Remember, scoring 100 plus on the TOEFL isn't rocket science. It's the little things you do that make all the difference. Until next time.